Hi everyone, uh, we'll get started. So thank you everyone for joining us today's webinar. Uh, my name is Su Win Yoon and I am a project lead at Career Future overseeing our work on transition justice. And I'm going to be the moderator of today's event. And Career Future is a United Kingdom registered nonprofit organization whose mission is to investigate and document human rights violations in North Korea to accelerate justice for victims and support accountability for perpetrators. So today during this webinar, we are going to have a discussion on transition justice without transition lessons learned from Syria for North Korea. So first, I'd like to start by explaining um, the background of the context to give our audience a better picture of why we think this dialogue is important and why we have decided to host um, a webinar on this specific theme. So transition justice by its term implies a political or institutional transition in which a state and society moves from the aftermath of conflict towards peace, justice and reconciliation. Yet the recent trends of transition justice show that the transition justice initiatives can be implemented in the midst of massive human rights violations and even in the absence of political or institutional reform. So understanding how transition justice can be successfully implemented in situations where there's no seemingly no, there's seemingly no end to conflict or the commission of human rights violations in sight is particularly important in the context of both Syria and North Korea. So we will start our discussion on transition justice in a pre-transition period in Syria and North Korea by setting out the theme to um, help everyone better understand the situation, also to help people compare these two situations and think what we can learn from it. So our panelist Heju Kang will open the webinar by speaking about the need for transition justice for North Korea and what has been done so far. So our panelist Heju Kang is a co-director at Korea Future where she co-leads the organization's work documenting religious freedom violations and crimes within North Korea's penal system. She has a background in civil and gender-based rights and has led large-scale investigations of human rights violations. Heju, the floor is yours. Thank you, Subin. Um, welcome, everyone. And it's such a pleasure to speak alongside such dedicated and distinguished human rights advocates and to explore spaces where we can work together on pre transitional justice efforts for victims of mass atrocities, both in North Korea and Syria. So I'll discuss uh, how some of the core concepts that form transitional justice have been imagined for North Korea and how innovative pre-transitional justice efforts can offer opportunities to North Korea's diaspora to realize justice in the face of what can often seem like an entrenched impunity. So firstly, let's state the obvious. North Korea is not transitioning away from its structures of rule that have subjected its citizens to methodical human rights violations and that have led tens of thousands to flee, hundreds of thousands to go missing and millions to die nor is the country open to mechanisms of justice that could hold accountable persons and organizations within the government who are responsible for international crimes that a United Nations Commission of Inquiry in 2014 found to amount to crimes against humanity. Instead, we're documenting ongoing cases of arbitrary arrest and detention, torture and cruel inhuman or degrading treatment, rape and other forms of sexual violence and the deprivation of life among other crimes. And it's precisely because we do not see a transition happening in North Korea that the benefit of approaching transitional justice in the form of pre-transitional justice is so relevant. Pre-transitional justice gives us options when, as is the case for both North Korea and Syria, a regime has become entrenched but there is at the same time a large diaspora that's calling for justice and plenty of evidence to hold perpetrators to account under international law and different justice and accountability mechanisms. So if we think of transitional justice as a toolkit with options that can include judicial and non-judicial, formal and informal approaches, the question is what can work in a pre-transitional phase for North Korea? 
At the more formal and international end of the scale, there has been a United Nations COI, Commission of Inquiry on North Korea, which reported, and I quote, extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortion, sexual violence, persecution on political, religious, racial, and gender grounds, the forcible transfer of populations, the enforced disappearance of persons, and the inhumane act of knowingly caused prolonged starvation have all occurred in North Korea. The COI recommended a number of options that are suitable to various areas of transitional justice. And indeed, it practice one itself, namely documentation of human rights violations, which now live on in the historical record. And the one recommendation that has occupied the thoughts of many human rights advocates in the seven years since the commission released its report has been the referral of North Korea to the International Criminal Court. This would, in theory, have led to an international court assuming jurisdiction over crimes in North Korea and initiating investigations of senior leaders who have directed or overseen crimes against humanity, thereby strengthening the international rule of law and sending a strong signal back into North Korea that the world is watching and that crimes against humanity have repercussions. For many reasons, not least because North Korea is not a signatory to the Rome Statute and because of the likelihood of Russian and Chinese vetoes at the Security Council that would block a referral of North Korea to the ICC, this recommendation of the COI has never been fulfilled. It's also worth asking us whether the ICC really is the best accountability forum for North Korea. The crime base in North Korea is so massive and the danger that an accountability gap where the needs of ordinary victims may be sidelined by focus on the prosecution of senior leaders could run the risk of not fully engaging a North Korean diaspora that would want to see justice being delivered for all. A more appropriate option that would also hold jurisdiction over North Korea, but would likely have the means and the mandate to consider a wider variety of crimes and perpetrators would be an ad hoc international tribunal. The chairs of the COI who recommended the formation of such a tribunal, if the route to the ICC were closed, envisioned the tribunal as similar in its function to those for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. This tribunal, which would need to be passed by a majority vote in the General Assembly, would not require the consent of the Security Council or the North Korean government, and would gain legitimacy by the active participation of the international society. I don't suggest that this is an option that's going to be realized anytime soon. Uh, it may never come to pass, but for North Korea, it's undeniable that an international court would be a big step in widening the scope of accountability and justice, increasing buy-in from the diaspora and civil society, and in moving the accountability agenda forward in general. Uh, moving away from the international level, there are also options at domestic courts, which I know is something that Syrian human rights advocates have been leading on. In criminal cases, we're seeing European states, such as Germany and Sweden, exercising universal jurisdiction for suspects who stand accused of international crimes committed in other territories. The re recent Koblenz trial in Germany is an obvious example. And in the United States, there is precedent for civil cases under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, where private citizens may sue a nation state if that state has been designated as a sponsor of terrorism. North Korea is currently on that list. And while this isn't a wide open path to justice, it is an option. And both of these options are, of course, not an accountability or justice solution. They can, however, form an important part of a wider solution and send strong signals to perpetrators that they can be held accountable anywhere in the world for their crimes. Looking further to lessons from Syria, uh, and I would be interested to hear the uh, panel's thoughts on this, is um, the, the potential for a creation of a UN mandated fact-finding body for North Korea that would essentially pick up where the COI left off in 2014 and begin uh, to collect and preserve evidence of violations. So we've seen this option deployed for Syria in the shape of the triple IM, but also for Libya and Myanmar. My question would be then, 
how involved has Syrian civil society and the diaspora been in this mechanism? Has it been inclusive? Have certain violations or perpetrators been preferred or over others? And how have expectations been managed given that the triple IM is not a court or a prosecutorial body? Beyond international and domestic courts and mechanisms, we can look to the tools that make up truth processes. While the North Korean government does not engage in misinformation to the level of many other states, we always run the risk of losing important voices to history and consequently losing a grasp on the truth if we do not set out to document victim testimony. In the absence of truth commissions, which are likely only going to come after a future transition, a key part of our role as an organization is documenting human rights violations and preserving the evidence in our vaults. So uh, our organ we gather a large number of testimonies every year and analyze this information against international human rights law to ensure that we retain the individual experiences of victims and so that we can better understand the patterns of violations that take place across time and space. And our ultimate aim is for this evidence to one day be used in international or domestic courts, in non-judicial transitional justice processes, and in any other processes that deliver justice to North Korea's victims. And this leads me on to a critical point when it comes to documentation of evidence by civil society and other actors, including human rights defenders in the diaspora. We need to ensure that we are telling the full story and not contributing to privileged narratives that reduce the power of victim groups who already suffer from underrepresentation of the human rights movement. In the North Korea field, we have a 33,000 strong diaspora in South Korea, approximately. Despite accounting for 72% of the diaspora, women are disproportionately underrepresented in the human rights field. Across organizations working on North Korean human rights, men account for the majority of leadership roles. Just 24.3% of women are associated with civil society groups. And while we should not expect that members of a diaspora will automatically seek to become human rights defenders, we should be conscious of the gender imbalance and its impact on future justice. And this is something that we've been um, working on and we'll release a report on this later next month. And in turn, this gender imbalance has also led to underreporting of issues that are in fact prominent human rights issues, such as rape and other forms of sexual and gender-based violence, which will also be central to a comprehensive and equal transitional justice process. So the integration of a gender just approach to pre-transitional justice that seeks to demarginalize women's experiences and make them central to transitional justice processes is, I would argue, critical. And this is an issue that we'll be watching when it comes to the trial of Alaa M, the Syrian doctor in Germany, which maybe my fellow panelists will bring up. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words. Um, and also thank you for letting us know what has been done so far and also like various efforts to seek accountability or truth uh, through various mechanisms and platforms. And it seems like pre-transition period uh, presents uh, itself as an obstacle to these processes to seek accountability and truth, but also it sounds like it presents another opportunity to drive these uh, momentum or the delivery of justice to those who have experienced human rights violations in North Korea. So now we're going to move on and learn more about transition justice initiators for Syria and also to think about some of the key takeaways for North Korea. So our three speakers will each focus on these three main themes. They ask for participation, documentation of violations, and women's leadership in transition justice. We believe that these themes are particularly relevant to the transition justice initiators for North Korea, just uh, how Heiju mentioned in her speech, and many, human, uh, and many human rights advocates and organizations um, are working on these agenda. So first, many human rights um, organizations are operating outside North Korea to advance the agenda of justice and accountability. And I believe the Syrian diaspora community and civil society organizations 
are also pretty active with the agenda. So we believe that learning about their successes and failures could provide us with valuable lessons to further our impacts. So we have Ms. Uh, we have Dr. Yavor Ranglov as our panelist to share his remarks on the role of DAS participation and the Syrian civil society in driving the transition justice period process in a pre-transition period. So Dr. Yavor Ranglov is a research fellow at LSE Ideas and also a co-founder of the Civic Ecosystems Initiative. He chairs the governing board of the Humanitarian Law Center in Belgrade and also co-chairs the London Transition Justice Network. Dr. Anglo. Thanks very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure and privilege to be part of the, of the conversation and, and to think about how the, um, the Syrian case may be applicable and useful uh, in terms of thinking about uh, North Korea and some of the challenges of transitional justice there. I was asked to reflect in particular on the role of uh, the diaspora and, and civil society organizations uh, in these situations where there has not been a formal uh, transition uh, and one is uh, potentially not on the, uh, on the horizon. Uh, and yet there is demand for justice and accountability. Uh, and, and that demand that needs to do something about the human rights violations prompts I think both civil society groups, diaspora communities, uh, and uh, also international actors uh, and states uh, in the international system uh, to become more and more, I think, innovative in trying to find ways around some of these blockages and to explore opportunities for uh, at least beginning uh, tentatively a process of addressing uh, human rights violations. Now the emphasis uh, uh, in the Syrian case, as in uh, a number of other cases, I've done a, a lot of my work on the Balkans, for example, the, the, in, in that situation as well, the emphasis has been very much on accountability. Um, accountability norms, uh, and particularly the investigation and prosecution uh, of international crimes uh, has uh, created its own momentum uh, and sort of creates space, I think, for civil society and diaspora groups to connect to a global, broader, uh, often quite very well resourced uh, uh, agenda uh, where, where I think um, their efforts are, are, are critical, but also there is always the possibility uh, that this broader international agenda may end up conditioning, uh, shaping, uh, and in some cases even co-opting uh, the, uh, the work uh, the efforts of uh, civil society groups. Uh, in the Syrian case, the, the, uh, the situation has been uh, uh, very much one in which uh, the possibility for international criminal prosecution uh, has been foreclosed, both through the International Criminal Court and also uh, ideas for setting up a, a special tribunal for, for Syria. Um, uh, have not uh, uh, have been blocked and, and have not been able to make any progress. Um, nevertheless, there has been a strong emphasis on uh, pursuing the accountability path. And I want to distinguish the accountability path from a more restorative uh, justice path or reparative justice path, which unlike accountability, uh, which focuses on the responsibility of perpetrators, in restorative and, and sort of reparative justice processes, the focus is broader society and the victims of, of human rights violations, those communities uh, and, and individuals who have been affected uh, by, the, by the abuses. Uh, and, and in those sort of uh, restorative and reparative mechanisms, we have a range of options from uh, truth inquiries, uh, as Hajo already uh, noted, noted, to uh, reparations, restitution, but also increasingly important, particularly in a digitally uh, sort of uh, driven uh, uh, period, is the, the process of memorialization. Um, in, in, in the Syrian case, the, uh, what, what we found, uh, I'll be drawing here on research conducted with a, a Syrian colleague, Sima Nasser, uh, at the uh, conflict research program at, at LSE. What, what we found was that to understand the role of civil society and diaspora communities, it is useful to think about the broader framework 
uh, within which the sort of effort for documentation and justice takes place. In our research, what we really uncovered is uh, a, a sort of an ecosystem that emerged over time uh, organically, but also one that is becoming increasingly coordinated or orchestrated as well. Uh, an ecosystem that brings together a range of diverse actors. So that's the first characteristic I think that is very important, uh, both state and non-state, uh, Syrian uh, civil society uh, groups, diaspora communities, international actors, particularly UN bodies, uh, and also uh, key states uh, that have been involved in the uh, investigation of uh, crimes committed in Syria and increasingly using the principle of juris universal jurisdiction, also prosecution of uh, offenders for crimes committed in Syria, uh, particularly in European European states. So that sort of, uh, 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 that, that ecosystem that emerged for documentation uh, and justice, I think is very much responsible for the gains that have been made in the struggle for justice for Syria, particularly the uh, sort of the, the, this inability to find formal international uh, mechanisms for accountability have, has fostered, I think, uh, a growing emphasis on, on using universal jurisdiction as, a, as an alternative for the moment, uh, with all its limitations uh, uh, and all its uh, sort of uh, issues in terms of who can be prosecuted, the scale of atrocities that can really be addressed through universal uh, uh, jurisdiction prosecutions uh, in, in foreign countries. Uh, and also, I think very importantly, uh, that emphasis on accountability, which has really mobilized and provided momentum for many civil society uh, and diaspora groups, um, uh, I think has come to some extent at the expense of addressing the reparative and restorative aspects uh, of, of transitional justice. What does, this, uh, uh, what does this ecosystem look like and what might be usefully learned uh, from, uh, from the Syrian experience in terms of thinking about North Korea. Uh, I think that there's sort of three main elements. The one key element are the, uh, the actors uh, that are uh, either C Syrian uh, civil society groups that are formal organizations or, or more sort of fluid initiatives and networks, particularly in the diaspora. They have been very important in several ways. First, they have been very important in transferring and securing documentation by uh, sort of transferring it outside of Syria. Uh, evidence uh, in a variety of different formats that uh, has been uh, uh, preserved and is available now outside of the country uh, uh, that could potentially fit into a variety of different justice processes. Uh, the Syrian civil society and diaspora groups have also been very active uh, in uh, conducting uh, documentation activities themselves. Uh, uh, many of them uh, employing also local researchers who are based uh, uh, in, in Syria or local volunteers, uh, and some also relying on uh, sort of citizen journalism uh, as a form of, of collecting documentation. New digital technologies, I think, empower diaspora communities uh, in new ways. Uh, what we are seeing in the Syrian and a number of other cases is that uh, the amount of data, the amount of evidence, documentation, video uh, footage that is available uh, online uh, or that people have uh, lends itself to uh, crowdsourcing uh, uh, approaches to evidence gathering, but also very importantly, verification uh, of evidence. And I think that's another area where the, the Syrian diaspora has made uh, quite significant uh, uh, gains. The next step, of course, after gathering, uh, 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 the next sort of logical step after gathering documentation or, or collecting documentation uh, is how that documentation is going to be organized and preserved. And here we also see uh, the role of, of uh, civil society and diaspora groups in creating digital archives and databases. Uh, some of these are for the purposes specifically of uh, sort of organizing and making the data 
uh, easily searchable and usable. Uh, so it can support uh, uh, different kinds of uh, activities, but some of it also implies the creation of narrative. Uh, there is a sort of a particular way of curating the uh, particularly uh, archives, digital archives that are available uh, online that are already telling a particular set of stories that are already constructing, if you want, a narrative about the human rights violations uh, for which evidence is, is presented. Uh, and then finally, I think civil society has been very important and diaspora groups have been very important uh, in uh, providing sort of brokerage between different international actors and states that are involved in investigation uh, increasingly and, and prosecution also of crimes uh, committed in, in Syria uh, and also opening up uh, sort of pathways uh, finding different ways yeah, in which the broader uh, sort of uh, uh, Syrian community, uh, which is not directly involved in these efforts, may have a way to participate, to contribute, and to become uh, involved. So this is the first sort of uh, a very important uh, element of, of the uh, sort of documentation and justice ecosystem that we detected in Syria. The second one, uh, and uh, also critical, uh, is uh, international actors, particularly international bodies uh, and UN bodies, uh, the, um, the international, the, uh, the Commission of Inquiry for, for Syria has been very important in the fact that it, it has been a sort of a sustained effort uh, to document, to collect evidence uh, and to document and report on human rights violations. But I think uh, again, the instrument that has been mentioned, the international, impartial, and independent mechanism for Syria, which was created by the UN General Assembly, so it did not require uh, UN Security Council approval and therefore faced the potential blockages and obstacles uh, that referrals, for example, to the ICC have faced. What that mechanism has done is uh, it has become, if you want, uh, a sort of keynote in the ecosystem. It performs on the one hand repository functions. It is a clearinghouse in the sense that it collects the documentation, compiles, analyzes, and, and brings together all the different forms of documentation and evidence that a range of actors uh, have been collected uh, and gathering uh, over, over the years in relation to Syria. And that includes civil society. Civil society is a key partner uh, of, of, of the mechanisms of the mechanism. It also provides uh, a, a sort of uh, um, support function for particularly for accountability processes, because in addition uh, to collecting and analyzing evidence, the mechanism is also involved in actually building case files, particular cases with the evidence, with the rationale and the analysis that will be ready for prosecution whenever there is an available jurisdiction, whether that may be a universal jurisdiction, uh, domestic jurisdiction of a foreign state, or uh, some kind of international uh, criminal tribunal. So the, the sort of the, uh, the, the mechanism, that, that, that sort of coordination and, and repository role that it plays has been really important as a catalyst for all the other actors, I think, in the uh, ecosystem and is also beginning to bear fruit in terms of using its documentation, using the evidence that it has in order to support universal jurisdiction prosecutions in a number of, of, of states. And then finally, it is those states that have been willing uh, to, uh, uh, in some cases, create special war crimes uh, and crimes against humanity units for the investigation and documentation of war crimes, which are now embedded within uh, the national jurisdiction and also to investigate and, and prosecute, bring to court cases against offenders uh, for, for crimes committed in Syria uh, that I think have been a critical link uh, between the documentation effort and opening up a path to uh, some form of, of transitional justice, in this case, uh, uh, accountability. So very briefly before I close, uh, what are some of the, of the key lessons from that, uh, that experience 
Um, I think the first one is a, a sort of a guiding question for us was, can documentation uh, of human rights violations serve as a catalyst for justice? And the answer is yes, it can, but several conditions need to be, to be met. In particularly in relation to, to civil society, I think there are three main lessons. First, the documentation effort must be very robust and very targeted. In the Syrian case, because of the priority uh, of uh, uh, focusing on accountability and the emergence of key international actors uh, that were pushing for that agenda, mobilizing resources uh, and, and uh, sort of uh, networks around it, what this has meant is that more and more of the documentation effort has, has been generating the sort of documentation that is useful specifically in criminal justice processes. And that is important because different mechanisms of transitional justice require very different type of, of documentation. And also there is a different standard of proof. So I think a targeted and focused documentation effort that, that is driven by a, a sort of a particular type of justice, if you want, in mind, if not a specific mechanism, is very, very important. The second uh, is that civil society and diaspora communities need international allies. They need allies international, in the international system in order particularly to move from documentation and, and uh, evidence gathering from the investigation uh, to, to actual pursuit of, of, of justice. Uh, in the Syrian case, uh, I think that, that again, I mentioned that the two key elements, the two key allies in, in that have been the, uh, on the one hand, UN bodies, particularly the, the international uh, mechanism, but also very importantly, like-minded states, states that, that have increasingly started to uh, sort of practice and to embed the practice of, of, uh, of uh, criminal prosecutions on the basis of universal jurisdiction domestically. And so, so building these alliances and, and identifying uh, those international allies, I think uh, is very, very important. If uh, if the effort is to move from, from documentation to uh, and justice seeking to actual pursuit of, of, of transitional or pre-transitional justice. And then finally, uh, it is worth thinking about these, the role of the mechanism and the importance of having a sort of an actor within the ecosystem that performs these repository and coordination functions. What that ensures really is that all the disparate efforts for documentation, for collection of evidence, that they are, uh, that they are sort of, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, driven by uh, a specific actor with a, with a specific a purpose of pursuing, preparing the ground and, and, and then pursuing uh, uh, justice. And, and what that does, it creates its own momentum. It also shapes the agenda of civil society and diaspora communities. And that is a dilemma and a tension, I think. Nevertheless, it is clear that the gains that have been made in the, in the Syrian case uh, uh, have, uh, 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 are, are suggesting the importance of having this coordination uh, this coordination function within the ecosystem and having a repository, a central actor that plays this role in order to make sure that, that um, uh, concrete steps are being made and initiatives are being targeted in ways in which they can actually produce, uh, produce results. So I think I'll stop there uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Wengler. And I think there are so many aspects that kind of resonate with North Korean context, including the diversity of actors and stakeholders involved in the transitional justice processes, and also the emphasis on the um, accountability mechanism. And also one other thing that you mentioned about new digital technologies and digital archiving that has been a very much uh, ongoing discussion in the human rights um, um, activism for North Korea as well. Thank you. I've hoped to hear more during this discussion. So moving on to our second thing, um, despite limited possibilities to pursue justice in the domestic sphere, many domestic 
uh, regional and international organization have been working on the documentation pro projects to preserve the evidence and also to raise awareness about these atrocities. So we have Mr. Ibrahim Kasim as the executive director of the Caesar Files Group. Um, we will share his remarks on the documentation efforts for atrocities happening in Syria and what this means uh, for justice. So as a lawyer, he focused on cases to support detainees before the Syrian terrorism court. And he worked as a legal consultant to the UN with a focus on the Middle East and North Africa. Since 2016, he has been supporting and working with the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights as a research fellow in the International Crimes and Accountability Program. Mr. Kasim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you today. I would uh, I would start from the, the last point my colleague ever mentioned it about the role of the civil society. I will speak about our unique uh, experience in Caesar Pfizer Group uh, and uh, you know, our work in documentation. Uh, I will share in the beginning my screen. Uh, in my in my uh, speech, I will uh, focus about many points. The first one, I will speak about the uh, Caesar Pfizer Group. What is it, Caesar Pfizer Group? Uh, the role of uh, Caesar Pfizer Group in documentation and accountability in Syria, and documentation impact on transitional justice in Syria, and support of Syrian exiles uh, in the diaspora. Uh, and in the end, I will conclude with, uh, all what we spoke about. Caesar Pfizer Group, it's actually totally a volunteer and non-profit uh, non uh, organization. All the members of uh, Caesar Pfizer Group are working as a volunteer totally uh, uh, without any funding. They, many of them are still inside Syria. Uh, so most of them are outside of Syria. Uh, then uh, why was the name of Caesar chosen? Because it's uh, related for uh, military photography. Who used to work in uh, Syria and smuggled with his friend Sami, also uh, this nickname, with uh, thousands of uh, photos for thousands of victims who killed under uh, torture and uh, in the military hospitals, uh, intelligent uh, uh, prisons in Syria. And because Caesar uh, himself also, it's like a uh, symbol for the Syrian activists who are working in documentation in Syria uh, and collecting the evidence in Syria. Uh, Besides that, we uh, in Caesar Pfizer Group, we focus on many cases, not just for the torture. We are focusing on uh, sexual violence and uh, chemical weapon and uh, forced disappearance, uh, forced displacement also. So for that, we are talking about many files, not just the Caesar photos itself. Uh, we, in Caesar Pfizer Group, we are working in many uh, aspects, actually. We are working in uh, documentation. We are working in supporting uh, families to, to to know about the fact of their relative. We are working on uh, advocacy also to uh, by organize some uh, exhibitions for the victims' photos, and in same times we are supporting any uh, political uh, effort to uh, make uh, to find a solution peace main agreement in Syria. In, document, in documentation, we are working and document, as I said, the violence in Syria, torture and the chemical weapon, and for displace, uh, displacement, gender violence, uh, sexual violence, and other grave uh, crimes. We have a cooperation with uh, many international organizations, with the United uh, Bodies also, uh, who uh, concerned with uh, human rights in Syria, like uh, Commission of Equiry, IIIM, and uh, OBCW, and ICMB. In each organization, we are working with them and have cooperation with, the, cooperation with them regarding what they interest. As example, uh, ICMB, we are trying to support their work to find uh, any information about uh, the disappearance person or uh, a commission of inquiry to uh, collect evidence, triple IM to build, support their working in building the cases in Syria. And OBCW also regarding the chemical weapon. We, we organized many organiz uh, exhibitions in uh, Germany, in uh, uh, Copenhagen, in uh, even UK, and European Union to focus about what is going on in Syria, about the crimes committed in Syria since 2011, 
In same time, the, regarding this uh, exhibition, we wanted also to focus about situation for refugees who face some discrimination sometimes in uh, Europe, like uh, Denmark or another places, who, who the refugees who are now facing the, the possibility to support them, to push them uh, to back to Syria. For that, we're trying also to send this message that the crimes still continue and committed in Syria. Nothing has changed in 2011. By regarding the, the regarding this exhibition in accountability we starting our work and we can say we we lead this uh, process actually as a syrian organization since 2015 we started this process uh, and we are very happy to start this working in 2015 in france we uh, support this investigation regarding the uh, humanity and war crimes uh, by Caesar photos and other documents that we have it. And, and uh, regarding this investigation, which started in 2015, in 2018, France uh, uh, issued uh, three international arrest warrants against three senior uh, Syrian official, uh, the head of Inter uh, in, uh, intelligent air force, the head of the national uh, intelligence in Syria. The, their, both of these person are, we can say it, they are from the narrow circle, which are around uh, Bashar al-Assad, and they have committed uh, many crimes uh, in Syria before 2011 and after 2011, sure. In Spain, also in 2016, we support the investigation uh, for case uh, uh, for uh, uh, kidnapping and torturing and killing a person who has sister has uh, two double nationalities, Syrian and Spain uh, nationality. Uh, and uh, after that, the, the process started before the court in 2017. In Germany, the most work, uh, the most cases which we supported and worked in it was uh, in Germany, actually. In 2011, the structural investigation starting in Syria, uh, in Germany re regarding what is going on in Syria. And in 2016, uh, when I moved to Germany, to Berlin as an internship with ECCHR, we started to put but I started with, with ACCHR, the a strategy to work in building these files, and we focused on the first time, first uh, uh, steps on sexual violence on, against women and uh, torture. After that, we invited the Syrian organization to come to be part of from this uh, process. Regarding this uh, cooperation with the CESAR, ACCHR and Syrian organization, other Syrian organization, we have many cases now in Germany. In 2017, we started these cases. We have uh, now a case against military intelligence, uh, a crime against torture as a crime uh, against humanitarian humanity and uh, war crime, uh, actually. And in 2017, also, we have another criminal com complaint against uh, the uh, uh, the many of uh, the branches, military branches, and other intelligence in Syria, and also the military hospitals. This case we uh, completed, uh, have the complaint as Caesar files group just with ECCHR without an another partner. We focused about uh, this case on all these uh, branches regarding these uh, photos which we have. And regarding this in the cases, we can see in the future uh, how, how uh, is it very important for building another cases and to uh, be part from all the process and another uh, investigation. Also in 2017, we have another case against uh, Air Force Intelligent and Sednaya Military Prison. Prison. In 2018, we have uh, uh, the first uh, international arrest warrant was against uh, Jamil Hassan, who is, who is uh, the head of uh, the former head of uh, the Air Force Intelligent. And 2019, uh, we can see now all this uh, effort started to be on uh, more practical. We have arrest two person, former officer in branch two, uh, 251 in Koblenz. Now you are, uh, what you know about what is going, I don't know how much you have information about Koblenz, but it started uh, uh, in 2019 when they arrested these persons. And uh, in April last this year, who, the one of them uh, 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 have, have uh, four and a half years to be in prison because of his crime. And the other person is continually, the process are continuing. Um, we accepted to, uh, to end it in the end of this year or the beginning of next year. 
Later, uh, also a request was made to add the crime of sexual violence against women and forced uh, disappearance uh, added for this uh, process. And another places, we have also another cases uh, in Austria in 2018, uh, a torture as a crime against uh, humanity and a war crime also with ECHR and other Syrian organization. For Norway in 2019, uh, a new complaint also, we have it uh, uh, in 2019. We are continuous now also to have, uh, to exchange information with the units, cri uh, war crime units in Europe and with the international organ organization. The, the documentation impact in uh, transitional justice in Syria in many uh, aspects, actually. Uh, it, uh, it, it impacts uh, in the beginning now, uh, we are, or we can see in, in currently, it's the trial and the quantability. It's already started now. And in cover uh, the fact of the for forcibly disappearance, we have information we, uh, because of the documentation of uh, the violence, we have some information we give it for the families who are looking for any information. And it's also this documenta documentation, it's uh, about the history of Syria, this period of time of history. It's very important because now uh, regarding uh, at least 10 years, we have a lot of information because of this documentation. Before 2011, there is less than this information about what's going on in Syria. Now we have more information we are talking about uh, thousand and thousand of document, uh, documentation in Syria, or documents also. And this effort of documentation, uh, if we are talking about Caesar, uh, Caesar Prize Group also, we are putting a pressure on the, the politician to find solution uh, like uh, peace agreement or like negotiating, or even now this uh, pressure, uh, political pressure, it's make it like sanction against uh, the regime in Syria and uh, you, the other countries which support the regime like Russia or uh, Iran or another militia which support the Syrian regime. We have now like uh, uh, the protection of civilian, Syrian civilian in uh, act in America and another uh, sanction in European Union. And we can see all this documentation, especially the Caesar photos will be part and the main stone for all the uh, process, a legal process in Syria in the future, because of the, because of these photos and this evidence which we provided and we uh, documented, uh, we can depend on it to starting investigation in all the crimes here, not just uh, regarding torture or murder or in, uh, enforced disappearance. We can talk about enforced displacement. We can talk about another crimes. All of this will be very important part for all this process uh, in the future, because we are talking about 10 years of uh, unstopped crimes uh, in Syria since 2011. So we need tens of years actually to speak about uh, litigation and accountability in Syria. So this uh, documentation will be very important for the future, not just for now. Now it's for, for us, it's just, the beginning it's not all what we want it's just the beginning but in the future we can talk about more and more uh, litigation as Caesar files a group to support the syrian uh, exiles we can talk about many uh, points actually helping the families to uh, of the victims and the victims also uh, themselves to uncover uh, the part of the relatives and supporting the victims when uh, they choose to go to the litigation and judicial uh, procedure. Procedure we can support them. We can. We are talking about many cases now in Europe, and we can we can talk about uh, the case also in America to support uh, this case or to talk about the uh, the, uh, the communication with the ICC regarding uh, enforced displacement. All of these cases actually depends on this document, uh, document uh, not just for torture, for other crimes, actually. And regarding this uh, evidence, which we are documented, we are talking about making advocacy all the time and the uh, campaigns to support the victims uh, uh, in Syria. And as I mentioned, also to support the uh, refugees who are based outside of Syria, especially in Europe, who face now many discrimination in many places. 
to support them regarding this uh, or this advocacy. In the end, actually, in my opinion, although of this challenge we faced in documentation and we still uh, face it, uh, it's very significant to seek justice for Syrian and uh, support all this transitional justice mechanism. Two points also I can say it, it's very important we should uh, learning from Syrian uh, case. We, we don't want to just focus about uh, protect the information and security of the information of the data and that what is going on until now since years. Nobody spoke uh, or nobody provided the policy for to protect the victim themselves or the witness. We are talking about very long process for that we should find solution for to protect these people who are uh, faced many crimes, faced many deaths and suffered for a long time. We find we it's very important to find the policy to protect these people from the beginning of the, this process, not make it like uh, another uh, choice. The first choice should be like this. This is uh, the main point in my opinion. And uh, the other thing uh, we should looking for this documentation, not just for litigation, we should looking for it uh, like to support the victim themselves in the beginning. If they chose it to do use this documentation or this document to go for litigation, that will be their choice. Not we we cannot say that the no justice without peace. We cannot say the peace uh, uh, just depends on justice. The peace which uh, people are looking for it, it's different from person to person, actually. We cannot put more or, or a lot of heavy on the shoulders of victims. We cannot say for them if you didn't go for litigation. The peace will not achieve in Syria, and in the same time, we cannot say for them if you go for the litigation or justice, that means you don't uh, support the peace in, in Syria. We should support the victims and their uh, and their uh, goal and they what they are looking for, not decided for them. We should allow for them to decide. We should support them in their choices. And thank you for and sorry for uh, being very long. No worries. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kassim, for your words. And it is really interesting to learn uh, about what Caesar Fast Group has been doing because um, the visual documentation is one aspect that it has not been enough for documentation efforts for North Korea. And I also strongly agree with your words saying that visual, uh, the documentation is not just about litigation and the accountability, but also for the recognition of victims and, and for their redress. So thank you so much. Uh, for your words. So now we're going to move on to our last speaker. So in the midst of these efforts among the Syrian civil society, another very important agenda has been um, the women's meaningful participation in, in traditional justice processes. So this is very important in fostering inclusive peace and reflecting women's voices about their experiences. So our speaker, Jamal Saif, we, she has been there in the forefront for the movement to increase women's participation in political movements and human rights activism by co-founding the two organizations, Syrian Women's Network and Syrian Women Political Movement. She's also a research fellow uh, at the ECCHR and the chair of the board of directors at the Day After Project, which supports a democratic tr transition in Syria. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think I believe that uh, uh, there, there are a lot of similarities between uh, the, the North Korea and, and uh, uh, Syria uh, cases as from 1974 after his visit to, to Kim Il-sung, uh, Hafez al-Assad copied the role, uh, the, the, the dictatorship model to Syria. So we had the same practices and uh, it's the same structure, maybe the same style and uh, the, the security services also and the, uh, the brutal militia and all these kind of uh, uh, yeah, things. So um, I'll start from the point that Brahim addressed that uh, we at ECCHR since 2017, we started to uh, file a criminal complaint, file uh, to, to the uh, German federal prosecutor, and then uh, uh, Sweden, Norway, Austria. 
So, and as a result of this series of uh, criminal complaints, we had in June 2018 an arrest warrant against Jamil Hassan. And also we considered that the indictment in Al Khatib branch also it's a result of that. And despite that, uh, what Ibrahim mentioned that sexual uh, violence was on the agenda and the, uh, the, the investigation of ECCHR, but unfortunately this um, crime were missed from these two uh, legal documents. So that's why that's mean uh, 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 sexual and gender-based uh, violence, crime, and especially against women, against uh, uh, children, they were, were, uh, were missed. And that's why on uh, June 2020, together with our uh, partner, uh, female or uh, feminist uh, uh, NGO, we file on behalf of uh, seven survivors, female and male, we filed a, a criminal complaint to the uh, federal German prosecutor. Uh, our main demand was to uh, that crimes of uh, uh, sexual rape and other form of crimes and these uh, gender-based crimes to be recognized as a crime against humanity. And for this, we really we start to, to, to work closely with the, the uh, uh, women-led or feminist-led uh, NGOs to, to, to mobilize for, for, this, uh, to, for the recognition of these crimes. And uh, the, the argument, it's, it's important uh, or, or why uh, gender justice particularly is important for Syria because in Syria, in, in our context, like uh, when crimes against women and their body were used as a, a weapon of war. And with this patriarchal society, there is no uh, uh, recognition of that. In, uh, uh, it's the opposite. Women still facing discrimi uh, discrimination and isolation and stigmatization uh, on that. So this is, here, we, we in, in, as a feminist uh, NGO, we think that the fight for justice it's, uh, should be conducted with gender lenses and should be for, with, uh, focus with, uh, conducted with a special focus on, on intersectional aspects. It's very important to understand it's the reason uh, behind committing the crimes and the power dynamics also that led to, to commit this crime. It's very important to understand uh, um, the obstacles, the barriers that uh, prevent women to disclosing what they, they were uh, subjected to, not only concerning sexual and gender-based crimes, it's not only uh, women, but also children and men and all of that, but with, with uh, in, in uh, a conservative society like in, in, in Syria, it's very difficult for uh, uh, to disclosing that. So I think it's like uh, we played as a feminist or women-led NGOs, we played a, a crucial war, uh, 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 role to, to just to, to try to pave the ground for, you know, uh, 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 the road of justice, or at least to bear, uh, to bear the, 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 the uh, and and to to support the survivor to have uh, uh, the opportunity to access to to uh, uh, to justice. And um, for now, if you look for the the, the scene of the uh, Syrian NGO, we can uh, see that most of the initiative that they advocate for uh, the survivor in, in general, even the, the uh, enforced disappearance and all kinds of uh, uh, affected people, not only the victims themselves, but also the affected, the family member, the, 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 uh, the other uh, affected. Um, they are, most of them, it's, uh, they are women or, I, or the, they are playing a, a, a very important role in this, uh, um, in this level. 
and uh, as uh, Ibrahim said, it's for for uh, uh, working closely with the uh, the human rights NGOs, with the feminist NGOs. It's not only uh, to work on the legal uh, path, but also to protect the survivor, to provide them uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the good conditions, to to empower them to to. Uh, to speak out and also to take the lead to be in the forefront in the, uh, our uh, uh, fight for justice in general for Syria. With just speaking out, with uh, uh, disclosing what has happened, it also it's we are pro uh, protecting the, the narrative, our narrative for the revolution also and for the history for the new generation. Also, we are struggling for, for uh, justice in, in the same time. So we can say in, in the, to, 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 uh, the, to the, the give an, an uh, like scene in general, uh, and in uh, Koblenz in particular, the woman participation and the survivor participation in, in, in Koblenz, it's uh, uh, pretty much, uh, uh, better than before, as we have 16% uh, uh, women participation in the Koblenz trial, and they have the chance really to speak out and about why what uh, they were subjected to and what uh, were witnessed to, and uh, especially with a special focus uh, uh, on sexual and gender-based uh, crimes, which is... Uh, that led to uh, to the, the the court to accept to add or to investigate this uh, uh, to the, 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 uh, to 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 add it to the indictment and to investigate it, uh, this crime in in the court, which is I think it's a, a good improvement in this level. And still, after submitting the our uh, complaint, sexual and gender based complaint, we. Uh, still waiting, but we have a very good uh, signal that the, really the investigation would start soon concerning this uh, crime. So I think the work uh, we we can well now we started to 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 have this result with the uh, collaboration closely uh, supporting and working together with. Uh, survivor taking into consideration centered approach uh, uh, principle and uh, uh, yeah and uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, push forward and we can uh, uh, have uh, more uh, 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 it's a fair uh, road for justice even with the equality thank you Thank you so much. Um, it, it was really insightful to learn why women's meaningful partic participation and gender justice is particularly important. And also thank you for share, sharing your experience as a female leader who has been actively working on the agenda. So thank you all for your insightful remarks. And I also hope our attendees have gained enough ideas about transition justice process for both countries. And we were supposed to uh, engage ourselves in a panel discussion, but I've seen so many interesting questions from our audience. So we'll just move on to the Q and A uh, from our audience. So our first question um, to, is for Heju. So what do you think are some barriers to a more cohesive North Korean diaspora voice that is heard in the international community? Um, thank you, Supin. And thank you for whoever uh, gave that question. So um, there are certain figures um, who are currently representative of the North Korea field, um, but whether that's uh, representative of the diverse demands within um, the diaspora is another question. So the, I guess just as important as cohesion would be representation of diverse voices, just to speak to the question itself. But I would say um, uh, the lack of cohesion, um, the 
barriers to cohesion or or more allied uh, a diaspora that is more built upon solidarity um, are multifaceted. And I would say first there is the language barrier. Um, so English is not commonly used by North Korean diaspora, while official like justice mechanisms um, and processes have yet to accommodate languages outside the most widely used. So for instance, um, in that sense, like I would say capacity building for prospective justice actors within the diaspora is crucial, um, not only because of, um, not only because this will uh, broaden the opportunities for international um, alliances as Dr. Rangelov said, um, highlighted is, uh, critical for the success of civil society efforts, um, but also it will represent more voices and diverse actors within the diaspora. And just to um, give an example, the COI was not translated into Korean in its, incep in its in inception in the beginning. And even the currently available Korean translation is not an official version. So um, then there is also as, um, Ju uh, Jumana mentioned um, the gender imbalance. So the findings from um, our efforts, our organization's efforts to strengthen the capacity of uh, North Korean women as leaders in human rights um, suggests that North Korean women, because they're um, burdened with um, the responsibilities of care uh, um, and are financially strapped while they make up the majority of the diaspora, they lack the time, the financial resources, and of course the skills to um, engage not only on an international stage, but also within their local civil society ecosystem. So obviously then the voices that are apparent on the international stage would be very uh, limited. And finally, circling back to our earlier um, discussion, I think, um, North Koreans, I think it's very important for us to be conscious of um, the perceptions of justice by victims and have a victim-centered um, approach. So um, I think in, in, in that sense, um, those are some of the barriers to cohesion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So the next question is for, um, Dr. Ranglo. So this question is submitted by Nasneen Sadi Cummings and she's curious about the delineation between the accountability part focused on responsibility of perpetrators and the rest restorative path focused on broader society and victims. Um, he wants to our audience wants to hear your thoughts on how these different path handle situations where the line between the victim and perpetrator is a blood where the citizens can both have committed human rights abuses, but also been the victim of the abuses. <clears throat> Thanks very much for the question. I think it is useful to think about uh, sort of accountability on the one hand or, or um, uh, retributive justice and uh, more restorative or reparative justice as a continuum. Uh, because um, there, it is in the nature of particular justice mechanisms to uh, aim for particular outcomes, to use particular types of documentation, uh, and to use certain standards of, of proof, which I think <clears throat> inevitably, uh, inevitably sort of uh, means that when civil society groups in particular are thinking about pursuing uh, different pathways to justice, the documentation route, the investigation, the collection of evidence has to be conscious of these differences. Uh, for instance, in criminal prosecutions, the key point is to find linkage evidence that can connect the particular perpetrator to the crimes. That means the sort of the, the, the evidentiary process, the, uh, the, the whole sort of collection of, of evidence, investigation, very much driven by a focus on linking the perpetrator to the crimes and, and therefore linking to uh, and sort of a focus on, 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 on the perpetrator. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, evidence, information, documentation related to the victims is absolutely crucial. 
but in a way it is secondary and, and that uh, has, has implications. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, what we have seen increasingly in cases where there have been sustained criminal prosecutions, again, for ex one good example is the Balkans, is that civil society in that case is using the extensive archive created, for example, by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, very extensive uh, body of documentation, evidence uh, that has supported and emerged also from the trials. Uh, over almost uh, um, uh, 25 years now, they are using this documentation and evidence for other purposes, including for um, the creation of archives, digital narratives that are focused more on victims, on affected communities and on society at, at large. So I think it is useful to think about uh, sort of the spectrum, if you want, of transitional justice from more retributive or criminal justice approaches that are in inherently focused on perpetrators to approaches that, uh, that uh, are, are specifically focused, for example, on reparation or restitution of victims or truth telling. Um, and I think the field of transitional justice has moved away from uh, earlier times when these were seen as alternatives. What we are seeing increasingly is is a sort of a range of mechanisms that are seen as complementary. And in fact, uh, you know, criminal trials sometimes can open up pathways for reparations, for recognition of victims. Similarly, truth commissions uh, or, or fact-finding missions can open up pathways for criminal accountability. So I think, um, I think the sort of the transitional justice spectrum uh, is, is a sort of useful way to, to think about the different elements and how they come together. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, the question and answer. Uh, so we've got one question each for both uh, Mr. Yif and Mr. Ibrahim, uh, Mr. Kasim. So for Mr. Kasim first, um, our audience, I uh, was wondering if you could speak about how not having much visual documentation from inside the country might impact uh, the North Korean transition justice possibilities? And also, do you think other types of visual evidence like satellite imagery can provide an avenue to fill this gap? Thank you for, thank you for the question. Actually, the, the photos itself, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, 6,000 or 7,000, uh, less than 7,000 victims who killed under torture. Uh, and besides that, we have another victims who killed in uh, a great massacre or like uh, the fighters from the regime who killed also. We are talking about 11,000 victims actually, or uh, bodies who killed during this photo. But besides this, we have another cases. Actually, we documented uh, many cases regarding sexual violence against women with uh, chemical weapon, uh, many cases, not just for uh, torture. And, uh, even we, uh, we, there is a similarity actually with the case in uh, North Korea, but we can say that this, uh, the situation in North Korea is worse than Syria, because at least in Syria, we have some uh, ability to document uh, the violence in Syria, even with this uh, difficult, but we have this chance. In North Korea, it's m more difficult. I, I think it's sometimes it's impossible actually to, uh, to find this. But in the same time, you can do this by another way uh, in documentation. Uh, you can depend on the open source uh, in your documentation. You can depend on some information from the victims themselves. Even in Syria cases now, we are talking about 60% uh, from all this evidence or the, strong, uh, the strength of these cases depends on CESA photos and other document. Uh, but even we need the uh, same time victims and witness to support these cases. Uh, the, the operation itself, it depends on many uh, elements, the document, the victims, witness. For that, you need to work in many, uh, many sources, not one uh, uh, formation or source of information. Uh, as, uh, uh, as example, sometimes we are depends about interview with uh, uh, Pierre Petratos who uh, say uh, and spoke about their work in Syria, about what they committed, about their opinion. This is, will be very important. Uh, we analyze the information which we have it with some documents which improve the uh, 
uh, the chain of command in, uh, in the, the regime or the government. All of this is very important. And I think you can do it in, uh, in North Korea. It's, it will not be easy like Syria, but uh, you can do it in the same time. Uh, like satellite photo photos, you can do this actually in the same time. But the, the, another point, it's very important to uh, focus about it in this uh, regard, like the litigation itself not depends about uh, the uh, organization and civil society, what they want. It depends about the other part for this operation itself. We are talking about uh, the state which has uh, the uh, jurisdiction. Uh, as example, we are talking about uh, uh, in Germany. We, as I mentioned in the beginning, we started in sexual violence and uh, against women in 2016. We worked uh, side by side with the uh, torture, but we couldn't pre present this case or raise uh, this complaint until 2020 because the atmosphere from the other side will accept this uh, complaint wasn't is very good. But when they give a, a, a signal to have this complaint, we do it in 2020. But we cannot wait until to say you can now do it. We prepared everything until 2020 to have this complaint at that time, we present this complaint. For that, this this work it depends about how this organization work and believe in the victims and the witness rights and how to protect them. The in same time, not how they seeing how they are looking, how they are thinking that is the better way for the victim. The victims and witness should be very important part, and they have the main role in this process. And they, we should share them in the policy to protect them from all this uh, uh, risk, which coming from perpetrators themselves and some politician uh, and their uh, dreams and some uh, uh, organization who are working against this and some person who are looking for personal interest. All of this, this role for the organization should be. One of them also to find solution to sexual, uh, for so, sorry, uh, for support them, say, uh, and, their uh, like legal statement or legal residency and their uh, uh, refugee on, on sorry and as refugees you should find like, the legal support for them to uh, all follow all this process the the main point should be all the time to support the victims by many ways one of this support should one will, will be the litigation itself but we shouldn't thinking that the litigation is the main goal for us Thank you so much. Uh, so we will move on to um, the question from Misif. So there has been um, anonymous submission. So have there ever been have there been any initiatives to support women survivors of sexual violence in Germany, such as rehabilitation services? Uh, because this is also seem important to address injustice, and I am personally also very interested to know. Uh, maybe Syrian Women's Political Network or your female-led organizations have been working on to working on the redress for those survivors. Yeah, actually, uh, the, the uh, Syrian feminist NGOs they they are uh, focusing on that, and as we say, they try. The, they were prepared because we we started to work uh, closely two year three years ago. To, to see and to discuss how we could uh, deal with the backlash from the society before dealing with this, uh, you know, and disclosing and uh, addressing the, the, the crimes and to be recognized as a crime against humanity. So a lot of uh, Syrian women groups, they are on the ground, they are uh, now for after working for years, they are, uh, uh, qualified, they know how to deal with it. They have the, the real quali uh, qualification with, you know, dealing with survivors, how to protect them, how to uh, provide with specialists, uh, the, the psychosocial support and the in somehow the legal support. Also, the in in some centers inside Syria and also uh, for sure in Germany, for example, for. Uh, we work with the survivor that we work at the, uh, as ECCHR. Uh, we provide them from the beginning, even before start any, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, 
like uh, exchanging. We start, we provide them with the psychosocial support and then uh, we, we know exactly that uh, when exactly they can uh, 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 give their testimony or at least to participate, to be prepared to participate in, uh, uh, in any uh, legal action. So uh, yes, in Germany, that's uh, this uh, uh, support. Uh, it's really it's in Germany and in, in other uh, uh, for sure in European countries and in Turkey uh, still uh, needs are much more. It's bigger. It's a huge and you know the, the amount of crimes committed and the survivor. And uh, still after 10 years, we the, the crime still uh, continuing, still committing. So. Uh, the challenges it's, uh, uh, are huge, but still we are trying as a, 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 a women-led NGOs and also in general human rights NGOs, we are trying uh, our best still survive and trying to push forward. And uh, um, yeah, at the end, uh, we it's, it's our right and we have to struggle for, for it. Justice, it's very important, but we believe that uh, the real we, we cannot achieve this real result we be, be, be without a, a political transition really transition to a democratic country and have a political solution which really uh, led to a democratic country which with uh, citizenship and uh, for sure um, uh, justice and accountability it's the main part of this without uh, justice cannot uh, achieve any peace or any um, a fair solution after 10 years of uh, suffering of the, from these international crimes thank you so much um so there are so many good questions but I'm afraid we are running out of time and I'd really love to hear answers for these amazing questions, but hopefully we could get another chance in the future to discuss more about this uh, comparison between Syria and North Korea and to learn more about some of the um, key takeaways that can be applied for both situations. So thank you so much for so much everyone for joining us today and I really appreciate our speakers who shared amazing ideas and experiences. And I'm pretty sure our attendees uh, have also found the discussion very useful and insightful. And I think myself has learned a lot uh, from the Syrian case studies. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there are a lot of uh, aspects and takeaways that resonate with the North Korean context. So please do look into and support their important work. And you can find their links on our website and our Twitter post. And if you wish to know more about our organization and our work in North Korea, you can subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter for future events. And I've just sent you through uh, the link for our newsletter. So please make sure to sign up and thank you everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>